Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the New York Botanical Garden and our opening weekend of our Groundbreakers exhibition, which does include the Gardens for Beautiful America, the women who photograph them, upstairs here in our library. And we're so honored to have the curator here today to be able to give you the most fantastic introduction to that exhibition and a little background to how we've gotten here today uh, with the Groundbreakers exhibition as a whole. Uh, in addition to viewing that exhibition up in the library, we invite you to view Weird, Wild, and Wonderful just outside in the gallery. It's a display of botanical art and illustration. There's also going to be a performance here in the theater this afternoon of, from uh, Ragtime to Jazz, The Roots of Pop at 3.30, a live performance with Terry Waldo and his trio. Elsewhere on the garden grounds, we uh, invite you to explore the Poetry Walk, and also take advantage of the new iPhone app we have created for this Groundbreakers exhibition, where you'll see photos, um, uh, enhanced photos through the app and signage throughout the grounds that you can queue in to, uh, in, in order to activate this app. There's also plenty of garden collections that are in full bloom. The lilacs are in peak flower. The native plant garden is in spectacular color and soon to be peaking is the rose garden. So you'll get some early viewings of the blooms there. We have a number of upcoming events and programs throughout the summer related to groundbreakers as well as other festivals, including the rose garden celebration on June 7th and 8th, and also the big backyard barbecue the following weekend on June 14th and 15th. We have a number of uh, Jazz Age evening concerts throughout the summer uh, on Thursday evenings in July, June, July, and August. So we encourage you to take a look at our website to find out more about those programs. And the best way to take advantage of all that the garden has to offer is definitely through membership. So we encourage you, if you aren't already a member, to inquire with any of our attendants on your way out about how you can upgrade your tickets from today towards a membership and take advantage of all that uh, is in flower throughout the season. I'd like to just ask you to take a moment to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices that may make noise during the presentation. And if you need any restrooms, you'll find them in the gallery to your left, as well as drinking fountains. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sam Waters, the curator of our Gardens for Beautiful America show upstairs in the library. Aside from being our curator, he is also an architecture and landscape historian with a particular focus on the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He's authored the book Gardens for a Beautiful America, 1895 to 1935, and published several other books on American houses and gardens. He's also been a columnist for the Los Angeles Times Home section from 2008 to 2012. Many of these books uh, and others will be available in the gallery after the talk, and you'll have a chance to meet with Sam uh, and have his books signed personally to, your, to your, yourself and your loved ones. So without further ado, I'd love to invite now to the stage Mr. Sam Waters. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming in on this beautiful day. Um, this is an hors d'oeuvre uh, to what is in the exhibition. I'm not going to uh, uh, stay too long on each section, but sort of introduce you a little bit to some of the thinking that went um, with the creation of the Rockefeller Garden and the history that it comes out of. And you can, um, the photographs, I'll just mention a little bit, some key points to watch for, but you can go upstairs and learn a great deal more about the subject there. Um, I'm going to start with this because this is the world we're going to end up with at the end of this little talk. Um, this is the garden of J.P. Morgan uh, up above, above the Hudson. And um, you know, each one of these slides always was very particularly commissioned uh, because the garden, the photographer always had to have permission to go into the garden. And in this case, J.P. Morgan commissioned the photographer, Francis Benjamin Johnston, to go and record these uh, spring flowers. Now, um, it's significant uh, that the quote on the top, because Lady Bird Johnson really is the most famous figure in, in, in this generation, in our generation, 
um, that carried through what started in the beginning of the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. And it's a real sensibility because it wasn't just simply that flowers were pretty, there was an entire sensibility about what they in fact could do for public good. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about. So we're going to come back to these nice pictures, but we're going to start with what this came from. Um, so I'm, I'm unfortunately picking on Chicago, but we could pick on any number of industrial cities at the turn of the century. Um, and here, uh, there's the key uh, elements of manufacturing railroads, mining, and I could add into this, which all took enormous amounts of immigrant labor. And what happened was America got very rich in the industrial era, and it also created enormous environmental problems. And at the turn of the century, so we're in the Teddy Roosevelt period, uh, in case now you've been reading Doris Kern Goodwin's new book, this is the exact period of Taft and Roosevelt. And America, in a remarkable period, um, in a kind of cross-class uh, revolution, a political revolution, actually undertook uh, across the country um, beautification projects and this idea that we're going to lift America up out of its own industrial problems in all sorts of different ways. And one of the ways is going to be through gardening. Um, see, I get to pick on New Jersey, too. Um, you can see in this photograph, it's very deceptive, because what you have to note is that you notice how all the plants, uh, the plantings along the river, are all dead. And this was all over America. And Americans became very conscious of this. Most of the people, Ferran being an example, the people that we're talking about in Groundbreakers are really the generation after the Civil War, born in the 1860s and the 1870s, and they grow up in, a, in still a rural America. But by the end of the 19th century, which is say when they're 30 and 40, um, they look back and they have a real sensibility. They still see this agricultural and this uh, wildflowers in parts, but they also see uh, polluted rivers and this very degraded uh, conditions of uh, urban, urban life. Okay. Um, so you had these uh, environmental problems, you had this degraded uh, countrysides and cities in the country. And here you had another uh, defining part, uh, which is this divide between wealth, uh, the rich and the poor. Um, it was uh, the original 1% era. Um, and something that's important, uh, these photographs, uh, which by the way all come from the Library of Congress, um, this, these photographs of New York City streets uh, in fact have all been touched up uh, because in fact the streets were filthy, uh, they, had, they weren't cleaned, they had dead horses, huge amounts of manure, it smelled, and, and photographers were very uh, careful about how they um, pictured this. Now, this is a one side, this is just below where the Plaza Hotel is, and this is this famous uh, series of, um, let's see if I can do this for you. This is right here, uh, where William Vanderbilt lived with his two children on either side. Oh, no, he lived in the corner and he had these two kids, um, two, uh, two daughters, and uh, he is the one who inherits uh, the famous Cornelius Vanderbilt fortune. He leaves it to William Vanderbilt, the son, who then doubles it. <laughs> so they are hugely rich. They're richer than countries at this time. And they live down here, but they're one among uh, many all along and around the corner right up the street, which is where Tiffany's is. Across the street was Edith Wharton's aunt. And anyway, this is a kind of collection. of. And they lived here. And then very few blocks away uh, lived all uh, the, the immigrants who were making this industrial um, world work. And notice um, the conditions. Uh, something that becomes very interesting to the gardening world is uh, the problem of billboards. Billboards line the roads, you're going to see. And one of my favorite subjects is what they did with the laundry. This becomes a big crisis among very wealthy people, and they're going to go and have all sorts of campaigns to get the laundry out of windows. And <laughs> They're very, you know, they're, they're very ground up and very practical in trying to solve very particular problems. Um, and here's an inside. Um, here you have the inside. This is up on 68th Street. Uh, very wealthy industrial uh, uh, 
railroad and mining fortune, and then just blocks away uh, were what have now become very famous, uh, these famous photographs in the 18, late 1880s by a journalist, and he goes in with a flashlight at night and he photographs uh, the immigrants living 12, 14 people to a room. Um, and this is, uh, when you go to New York, you can see the Tenement Museum, and this is exactly this particular era. So you had this enormous disparity. Now, the, the <clears throat> Americans at this time, so let's say 1900, uh, they, the, the rich and the, what is the rising middle class, do realize that these are not conditions appropriate for what is going to be a rich industrial international power. And there is a lot of discussion in the period, and I'm, Edith Wharton, I'm just using as an, as an example because she's sort of a popularizer of this point of view because she knows all the intelligentsia, so when she writes her two famous books on gardens and one on decorating, uh, she's going to articulate uh, for uh, this, the reading class um, sort of major themes. One of is that we're going to um, do this through art, and this is going to civilize people, which is always a you know, dicey word now, but at that time, civilization meant we're going to lift up um, this um, immigrant class and educate the middle classes, civilize them in the European sense. And it seems obvious that the feeling for beauty, beauty becomes a big thing, uh, idea, and it's very defined what there were really clear ideas about what that was, which was all linked to long uh, 17th and 18th century philosophical ideas. And of course, beauty is going to be what Paris and Rome and London uh, are going are look like. And needs a careful cultivation as the other civic virtues. So you're going to link that something beautiful is something that's also good for you and good for the society. So these things are not aesthetics and political good and social good are all going to be linked and used um, to propel America forward out of this, um, what was Edith Wharton certainly thought of, uncivilized America. Okay. Um, so how, who's going to do this? Um, this is, for all of you who have a history sense, this is the period of the city beautiful, and there are many, um, people that participate this about in this in very different ways. Um, and I'm just going to give you some samples. And of course, women enter this in a significant way because women enter the workforce at the end of the 19th century because industrialization has made it possible for women not to have to stay down on the farm. I mean, that's, that's kind of a metaphor for it. But they, it's middle class and upper middle class women can leave and they can enter the workforce, but they can only do it in particular ways. And, where better for women who are always associated with home and civility and community? What a great uh, period for them because it's civilization, civic virtues, and beauty. And women enter it in, this is one way, they become these very leading nat naturalists because of course this is gonna be part of the gardening world. And you have Mabel Osgood Wright who basically resurrects the Audubon Society uh, that has had uh, on and off success, and at the end of the 19th century, she steps in, and her garden's still uh, here in Connecticut. Um, we have botanists, you have Elizabeth Britton, who's one of the founders with her husband in the New York Botanical Garden, and founds her local garden club. Um, I throw in a couple of men, um, you need, uh, you have Teddy Roosevelt, and you have John Burroughs, who was the great um, naturalist, great writer of sort of American naturalism naturalist movement, um, and here they are in Mohawk, uh, I mean, in, out in <clears throat> end of Long Island, and Montauk, and you, Teddy Roosevelt, right, is the great uh, figure in this moment, and he's interesting because Roosevelt represents the other part that ha is going on, which we're not going to talk too much about, which is um, American as it became uh, industrialized, and you had this the leaving of the farms, going to cities, um, there was a great crisis in this country of what was going to happen to the rural America. And, and, and they turn, Americans all over America turn to the central government for the really uh, in a s profound way, and they turn to the government as a way to help um, reconcile uh, many of these uh, environmental issues and social issues that the gardening world is also going to be addressing, and he's kind of a voice for this. A tricky character in all this, but nonetheless a figurehead for it. Um, 
you need, uh, you need the rich. Um, and here you have a Mrs. Pratt, uh, who was a, a, she lived in a 1,100 acre estate uh, with several uh, Pratt uh, children and who all had their individual 35 acre estates. And she was a great leader in the garden club world. And here you are, you have some sort of sense that here she's walking through her garden. Um, you know, somebody asked me whether Beatrix Ferrand or these patrons did the gardening. And I think you <laughs> get an answer uh, that Mrs. Pratt is not out there with a shovel. Um, so uh, you have some sort of sense of this, um, how, you know, and it's interesting, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how there are no people in these gardens, but anyway, this is Mrs. Pratt. And Mrs. Pratt brings along many of her close friends and is hugely instrumental in really giving the voice to the Garden Club of America. This is the, the, they called it the mother of all garden clubs and it was founded in 1913 and I just want to point out an interesting thing to keep in mind here is that this is the same year that you had the Armory Show that was just at the New York Historical Society and one of the things that's in the background of this is the rise of modernity and this is a different group. This is not the group that's going to go and start collecting avant-garde paintings, right? This is the post-impressionists. These are much more conservative, uh, um, different part of the society. Overlap, but this group on this train, they were collecting Monet's. Now, I give you some sense of this. Uh, I um, identified uh, the women uh, on this train and I added up their net worth. <laughs> and <laughs> so back, um, so in today's dollars, they were worth what is estimated by estimate of four to five trillion dollars. So it just gives you a sense of the enormous, you know, John D. Rockefeller at 1900 in our dollars today was a trillionaire. So um, this is enormously important to keep in mind when you see these gardens and you see this culture because it is really being fueled. It is, doesn't happen without enormous dedications of money as well as time. I mean, it isn't, they are not, they're very serious. These ladies on the back of this train, this is them going to California. They made annual tours of uh, garden regions in America and they knew their plants. They were completely dedicated to the subject of gardening and gardening in public and their own responsibilities of creating gardens that would become models of taste and what I would say refinement uh, for what they saw as middle class Americans. Um, they, now these garden clubs, there were many of them, but the Garden Club of America was a leader particularly for the photographers and Beatrix Ferrand was one of the two outside advisors to the Garden Club of America when it's founded. Um, so they did, um, they were industrious and they had, uh, they achieved enormous results. And one of them is they cleaned up all the railroad stations. These were, <laughs> you'd pull up and there was all the litter from the railroads. When the railroads were built, they just dumped all the construction litter along the sides. And these women came through all across America and cleaned up the railroad stations. And here they are having an annual flower show and they are raising money for the Hartsdale station. They, remember the billboards, and uh, they clean up the roadsides. And here you have Gun Hill Road, and you see all the billboards advertising all the manufactured products. And here they are. Uh, this is the Bronx River Parkway uh, Commission. But the women are all in the background of promoting this kind of grooming and cleaning up of the roads so that you had this, um, you return to a kind of pastoral idea of what it was to live in America and what America was. Because remember, in a Jeffersonian sense, you're always, America is defined by the land. Um, they did prisons. Um, they, <laughs> they had a rose, they planted a rose garden in Sing Sing. And here's a very famous uh, garden uh, by the Garden Club of Marquette. Uh, and this is the, this still in part uh, exists. And it, the prison is like where we're standing. This is taken from the, uh, the prison bill. And there they are with this formal garden. And you know, this idea that Edith Wharton was talking about, about civilizing uh, America, right? <laughs> we're going to get these prisoners to behave by seeing a beautiful garden. Okay. Uh, you have the New York Botanical Garden is founded in this period. You had Elizabeth Britton. And you know the Botanical Garden continues in this way because you look and you see these gardens by Coffin and Ferrand and Shipman. Well, they're all women and they're all at the New York Botanical Garden. And for many years, the, the Garden Club of America was very involved with the garden. 
and you can see there's always planting. And here is, of course, the epitome. This is the building we're in, our next to, and this is the epitome of a city beautiful uh, building. Um, they fund. Education becomes a very important part of the women's movement within gardening. And they fund uh, women were excluded from university programs of landscape programs, all of which are founded, by the way, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, because industrial, the needs of industrial society are going to require specialization, right? And this is the beginning of, of the professional uh, landscape architect and architect and all of this professionalization. And so the women, um, women found schools for women to be educated in horticulture and landscape design. And here's the, um, a, a, a garden uh, outside what was the Ambler School, still exists today. They had flower shows, and like today. And it's, it's very interesting, you go to that show, and it's, we still have this here, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the New York Botanical Garden is particularly good and has maintained this long tradition. All of you may have remembered the International Flower Show in New York, which doesn't happen anymore. But here you have um, an interesting show in Boston. Uh, this was one of the great grand horticultural societies. And it, um, here's this man, and they created this uh, Ravine, you see there's up there are, it's vaguely you can see that there's all of these trees have been planted in an archway and they created this 80 foot drop waterfall that came down and they created this river that came along and then they planted all these native plants to teach people how to create native plant gardens in New England because this is this period where they want to go back and restore America. Um, I'm sort of American traditions, and here you have this man, and you see all the signs on the plants. So, and what I learned, 88,000 people came to this in a period of a month, and uh, what happened is that they told people to come with a notebook and to write down all the plant names, and then they would take them back to their local flower shop, uh, garden uh, societies, and then they would all discuss how to get the plants, and then the garden societies were then working with the government to eliminate uh, quarantines because it was, of course, there was politics uh, about how, what plants were going to be brought to America. Anyway, uh, the New York public sc schools had a whole uh, series. They had these, here's an annual flower show. And this was founded by a woman who was a teacher at Hunter High School. And she creates this whole program within the, uh, the public schools. And the National History Museum is involved with this. And <laughs> you see all them bringing their prize flowers that they've raised in their backyards. Um, and I just want to show you that they brought this educational idea into their own gardens. And when you see photographs, you have to think, oftentimes remember that the, we're seeing them photographed for a reason. Uh, it's not just I want to show off that I have a fancy garden. I'm also going to tell you, uh, the reader of magazines and the buyer of books and uh, the, atten the people who went to lectures like this with slides, these, kind of, these slides, and here um, is a children's garden on an estate in Long Island. Um, and in that little miniature house, um, there was, you, children learned how to arrange flowers. Um, it's, I mean, there's a different group of children, right? I mean, there's a very particular group. Uh, this is how your garden is going to look if you behave. Um, one of the things that they did in these um, gardens, which is, uh, this is not one of them, but they built miniature houses and not only did you learn to garden, you also learned to cook. They were two-thirds scale, and there were small kitchens and small living rooms, and you had this whole etiquette that came along with being a civilized uh, person. Okay. Now, um, so, <clears throat> so in this, the big subject within the garden club world um, and the big movement was to get everybody in America to basically clean up their act. Plant the backyards, groom the parks, put trees on streets, educate your children, and most importantly was to, as I said, to take care of your own um, home inside and outside, and there were rules how that was supposed to look. This was not vague, right? This is the era of good taste, and um, there were very specific ideals that people uh, wanted Americans to aspire to. 
and they made this remarkable um, align. Uh, they they were able to um, make a logic that there was no difference. Big or small, rich or poor, you were all responsible and you could all learn from the same sources. And I just show you um, this. Uh, this was just sent to me by the Library of Congress uh, 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 photograph uh, collect, uh, curator and uh, you see this wonderful $2,500. So that's about, uh, in 1920, uh, that's about, um, about $45,000. And here we have, let's say that that was probably, that was closer to you know, four or five million. Um, and you see the basic ideas, the same. It, it's uh, long traditions, but you see there's the formal, uh, the formal flower garden, and here you have the bees, and you have the flute orchard in the back. So there was always a, a horticultural component because people were still growing uh, their own food even though it was beginning to be uh, centralized and, and, and distributed through grocery stores. And, um, and you see this, and you see the beginning, it's a little fuzzy here, but you begin to see the urbanization. This is a kind of suburban ideal, and you still have uh, this wood frame, uh, earlier house uh, design, kind of uh, vernacular architecture in America, but you see all the alleys of trees. And then um, next door, uh, next on the other slide, uh, here's uh, the model of what all this ideal was. And this is a, a garden. Oh, sorry, um, there. I, I'm. 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 Okay, what have I done here? I'm. Oops. Sorry. Let me go back here. In this world of this, your backyard, that is going to take a step. They're going to publicize this to the American public, and the way they do it is going to be through magazines and bulletins, and they're going to do it through slideshows like this, and. Um, These are all funded by the garden clubs, and they're going to require, this is a slide of one of the houses where they gave lectures, just to give you an idea of who's coming to the lectures and how they get people, and this is like a model garden, um, railroad of fortune. Um, they're going to need uh, landscape professionals who are going to talk about landscape architecture as well as design the gardens that are models, and you have the three that are featured here in the exhibition. You're going to need writers, and this happens to be a very famous woman in this period. She was a garden writer, but she also had probably one of the most famous gardens in the period, uh, Great Gardens, which becomes famous for um, Edith Beale, uh, the little Edie. Um, you know, this gets, turns into a wreck, and they're eating cat food uh, in the backyard of what was this garden. Um, this has still been restored. It's in East Hampton. The ocean's out there. And this was the ideal kind of garden, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And there's Mrs. Hill up there. Uh, with her Scotty, and they need photographers because this is a machine, right? You're going to write about it, you're going to publicize it, and now you have to show people how it's all going to look. And here we have the three photographers, Maddie Edwards Hewitt and Francis Benjamin Johnston photographing Biltmore, the Vanderbilt Estate, and, and then there's Jesse Tarbox Beals at one of the exhibitions. And you see, uh, it wasn't so easy. These, these photographs are always very uh, sly because think of what it was for them to physically do some of what they're about to do climbing in. Um, so back to Mrs. Coffin, Ms. Ms. Coffin. Um, so this is this model estate, and I'm going to show you uh, two or three model estates. I'm going to talk to you how they thought about them so that you can now um, lead up a little bit to so you can think of the Rockefeller estate as in this kind of tradition. And this is what people are going to see in magazines. I mean, these photographs were public. I mean, they were published, and the gardens were published, and people saw them at garden side uh, shows. And this was, this was uh, um, people went to museums and uh, clubhouses, and they went to Mr. Crocker's house, but they also went to small auditoriums all over America, and they would see pictures like this. Um, now, this is an estate uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, it is in <coughs> Southampton. It was owned by a very um, wealthy lawyer and who was married to an enormously influential woman who was uh, very uh, involved in the um, garden club world. But her husband, her father, was a very famous editor in the 1870s and 80s. And so she grew up in this intellectual world of the group of men, particularly, that are going to articulate what is civilization. So she has this very clearly in her mind when she creates this estate. 
and you see and you see here uh, the components of an estate. Uh, this is uh, you can see there was still rural farmland. Um, always the estates were tucked in, and you have the formal flower garden. You had over to this, in the background, you would have had the vegetable garden in the way back there. Uh, there was the service uh, entrance on one side, and you came, there was the, this is the, the garden side of it, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about how this worked. Now, um, all of these gardens, and the Rockefeller garden is in the same um, model as this, um, the big change for garden design was to, uh, the garden became a link to the house. Uh, what they did not like about ga Victorian gardens is that they saw it, uh, they saw the side, they didn't like any of the coloring problems, you know, too bright and flashy and bad plants, and you know, they did hated the Victorians by this point. Um, they, uh, uh, the Victorian garden was not architecturally interrelated to the house, and so you can see how architectonic this all became, which is everything was related and all the views were considered. These are very carefully constructed ideas about what were good gardens, what made good gardens, good views. And the views were all related through all the rooms so that when you came into a room, you had a picture in front of you that was um, beautiful. Now, in this case, there's always, a, there's always in the background of all of this, um, what were the ideals? And in this case, um, this is, um, sorry for this slide, is a little blurry, but um, this is out of Edith Wharton's book on Italian gardens. And what they copied was the Villa de' Medici in Rome. And so you can see uh, that famous uh, <clears throat> loggia of the lions. You can see it almost, uh, quite reproduced over in the house on the left, Mrs. Boardman's uh, place. And this was bringing Italy to America. And we, by association, we, the civilized, wealthy, cultured American, we're going to, sh we're going to have that kind of civilization come here. But we're going to do it in our own way. There's always this sort of American ideas. I mean, there wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a um, slavish copying of the, this uh, Villa Medici, but there certainly was the reference, and it's very distinct, and everybody talked, wrote it, and everybody would have, everybody in this world would have known the reference and told people, well, you see, this is what makes this good. Okay, so there's a photograph of the garden. Uh, it gives you some sense, as you'll see upside, all of these were hand-painted, and the slide artist was very knowledgeable, and you see the, the snapdragons, and you see, when you go to the uh, uh, the Rockefeller Garden, you're going to see some of the same kind of sensibility of these very lush, colorful uh, flower gardens. Uh, they required m huge amounts of water. Uh, they're completely an illusion of, uh, you know, I just went into the backyard and planted a flower garden. Um, no, they didn't. They had uh, 40 gardeners and they grew them in greenhouses. And it's, it's a very complicated um, a system that they had in order to make gardens look this way. Now, the slides. Um, as the New York Times wrote yesterday about these kind of small views. Um, the small view is not just because the camera, the, the scope of the camera, the, the width of the lens, uh, the potential for that was somewhat limited, but these were intentional because these were instructive slides. They were to teach you how to do things well. And they were always, they were very, um, they were always, corners of gardens, because they're going to tell you, the lecturer would have said, this is how you do steps into a garden. This is how two urns look. This is how a head should look. So they're always uh, look in slides and be very aware that you're being told something. It's not just to uh, show off, although that's always in this in the background, but this was very instructive, and you can see how architectural this was. Okay, uh, so you had the Italian world. Uh, Italy, France, and Italy were the big winners uh, in civilizing. Uh, and then there was uh, America. America actually gets to, uh, there's a big rise of the colonial revival in this period. They're going to look back to the founding fathers. All the women are going to look back to founding fathers. Um, and you have here, for Ellen Shipman, this is a 
beautiful uh, 18th century house that overlooks the Rappahannock River right to Fredericksburg. It's an absolutely enchanting place if you ever have a chance to go. Um, and this was built um, by, uh, restored uh, by uh, an heiress with a lumber fortune. And something about this house, you see all this rustic, this sort of the brick and the whitewash, this completely put on. It, they, they spent weeks uh, rubbing the paint on and then rubbing it off to give it the patina of old, what they thought old colonial America looked like. This is, and everybody imported the boxwood. It's, and Ellen Shipman designs this, both this riverside and this back flower garden. And this would have been considered uh, a colonial revival a garden, you know, you think of Mount Vernon being exactly that moment, uh, much beloved by Edith Wharton. And all the flowers, you see the pansies, there was a whole, they had lists of flowers that were appropriate for certain styles of gardens. And there was this list of what they called the grandmother's garden, because grandmother would have been 1820, uh, 1810, and so they were kind of very um, thoughtful about, we're going to put in the back of a colonial house, a colonial revival garden. And you can see this, um, here's this sort of parterre. Um, obviously, they're thinking of Europe is always in the background. Now, I just include this because it so um, tells you something about the time. For all of the fantasy of we're living in Italy and we're going to have a villa or we're going to live back with uh, Jefferson and Madison, um, here's a garage. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the ways that they're able to find out about the countryside and know America and see the problems and educate people is because of the automobile. You're able to now, and there's all the garden clubs had these tours where they would recommend people to go out and drive through the countryside to learn about how native, native plants were, wh what the condition of fields were, and they could all go visit each other, and here you have a garage. And I just point out that this slide, uh, this is a good example of beware of what you're looking at because when was the last time your hay basket looked like that? Uh, <laughs> perfectly posed. And by the way, there are no cars showing, right? Because you're not going to spoil this, um, this vignette uh, and this illusion, this kind of romantic moment uh, by having all of these un unattractive machines. Uh, they were in love with the car, but <laughs> We'll take them out of the photograph. So just be, and this was, uh, by the way, to show you how to do a garage, how to plant a garage, and you have the nice dovecote uh, at the end, which was one of the favorite features of the period. Um, so I'm going to um, summarize what you're going to go now see the garden that went with this uh, small place uh, above uh, <laughs> in Maine. Uh, and the garden that you're going to see, it, it was over uh, in the back in the woods. This is obviously a fall photograph. And, um, you know, this is the um, culmination of a, moment, of a moment of this period. It's very short what I just talked to you about, this progressive era, social conscience, ground up, take care of your backyard, um, and you can do this through beauty and gardening and cultivating. And it's going to come to a close pretty quickly because the depression hits and this is going to radically change uh, the labor picture. It's going to alter, it's going to change the money. Um, and it's also going to become um, impossible to do because of the war. The next blow to this world is going to be the Second World War. And this garden has many of the attributes of what I've talked about in terms of design. It's the last of a generation. It really is because this garden is still being planted in the Depression. Um, and I'm going to just leave you with this uh, picture because this is the garden you're going to enter in the conservatory. And here is one of the entrance gates. And you can see that the doors have been reproduced in the greenhouse. And this is a garden set into a woods with a wall, and it has Another cultural reference, which is here you have um, um, in this garden China and Korea. And these are great civilizations. They're no different. This is that Edith Wharton sensibility. You're going to look to where was, um, where was culture. And the references are eclectic. They can take Chinese and put this, this, in fact, this is an English flower garden inside of a Chinese uh, wall, and it has Korean uh, statuary that come up in a pathway. Um, it's not a melting pot. It's very, um, it's not melting pot because not everything is included. <laughs> and by this time, 
Um, this is, if you were thinking about design and you were interested in being civilized and educated in this period, um, you knew the great moments in civilization and that meant you could have Chinese and Korean and Italian and French and Islamic. Um, and they were all brought together in America in a kind of synthesis of what would make a new American garden. And then I'm going to pitch <laughs> the garden photography exhibition, which is a big part of this, part of this show. Um, and then you can see uh, in that show how people came to learn. As I said, a big educational proponent, and photography is essential to this, because this is the change in this period, is that this is the moment where America, the world, b begins to go from knowing the world through reading to knowing the world through seeing pictures. This is going to be, this is a seminal, extremely important change. And these women photographers absolutely understood this. They saw, they found themselves in a new career in this world open to women. And photography became this way for them to come in as a professional. And this rise and proliferation of the pictorial world is profound. Um, by the 1950s, American intellectuals are going to look back and say, what, what, what did we just give up here? Right? I mean, what happened here? Now they don't know the world anymore. They only know the pictures, something that we certainly all know now. Um, and this picture, um, you can go upstairs. Uh, there's a whole um, case devoted to a discussion about Francis Benjamin Johnston coming to this garden um, in 1917 for a World War I fundraiser and what she does when she photographs the garden. And I just point out just um, some of that idea that I was saying, um, which is this garden was all themed in blue colors. It's in process of being restored. Um, and it was only uh, designed to bloom for six weeks. And they planted large sections of it in greenhouses. <laughs> so they had 40 foot seven gardeners and they were totally dedicated to taking care of this and some other parts. And they couldn't get the flowers to all time properly when they first planted it, so they just built a hundred, like a 170 foot greenhouse and they planted it all in the greenhouse and they would keep moving it in so it was always in this perfect state because beauty was all about perfection. So you weren't going to see weeds. And so I'm going to leave you with this photograph, and you can now go and, and experience this world, a snapshot of this world of this social betterment through gardening. Thank you. Thank you so much. for that. Not a fire drill for you to exit too quickly, uh, but actually just my announcements for the opposite, so not to run off too soon, but uh, we'll open up the floor for any questions that you may have uh, for Sam. Um, another big round of applause for his presentation and for having him here. So we'll take a few questions now before we break to go to the book signing as well. Yes. yes. Yes, yeah. And you might know that this is the 100th anniversary of our children's garden. <laughs> and it goes right in. Yeah, it's the exactly that. In America. Right, it well, right in with your theme. there it is. Um, we also have gardens designed by our side priests. Yes, um, yes. And just some of the old times of the garden talk about when she came in to design the garden, she had her hat and her gloves. <laughs> Yes. Well, it wasn't. That's. I, I. I said. I don't. I was laughing at that time they came up with the title of this exhibition, which is brilliant. Uh, I said groundbreakers. Well, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know how much groundbreaking Beatrix Veron was doing, but, and I tell you that uh, Francis Benjamin Johnston went to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Uh, in 1925, after she came back from Europe and showed all her slides of European gardens, yeah. right? yeah. including Edith Wharton's garden. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Would this picture be also have been hand painted? 
they're all hand painted. They're all black and white photographs that then are, uh, that were hand painted with like, basically squirrel brushes, the squirrel father. You can see upstairs, you'll see how tiny these slides were. And the catch, the part that's interest, uh, complex about the slides is that they didn't know what the garden looked like, right? The slide artist was sitting uh, in some studio and they would be sent a black and white photograph with instructions. The, Francis Benjamin Johnson would come back and say, um, there are these varieties of flowers and the general impression is purple. Right? Now, the, it wasn't, they had to achieve two things, right? They had to make a slide you wanted to look at, means that you had to make a work of art, and they had to also be horticulturally correct because this was a hugely educated audience. They knew the flowers. By, they knew that horticultural planting world wonderfully and with a kind of reverence, even though they were not necessarily doing the work. They still knew the work. They knew what they were planting. And so you see how beautifully composed this photograph, this slide is, right? And as I say, I, I always refer to this weedless perfection, right? You never see a dead leaf. You don't see a dead branch. You don't see, you don't see weeds because whatever there were gets painted out and, and made uniform across with the grass. This is, this is about uh, an ideal. And they, that idea, they had to study um, horticultural books, these painters, they had to know what gardens look like or should look like. <laughs> and that's, that's what this is about. This is about perfection here. Um, they, um, remember the boxwood garden? Where, uh, in one case, uh, they bought, one estate bought out the stock of boxwood. They bought 120,000 boxwood and they just wiped out the entire collect, uh, boxwood um, inventory in Holland and in Germany one year. They were importing enormous numbers of plants. And they, well, it was part of the culture uh, was being knowledgeable about plants and also the rarity of the collecting. Now, um, the plant uh, variety was much narrower um, for all sorts of different reasons. Um, but one of the efforts made by the garden clubs was to uh, go against, uh, to take down uh, plant quarantines. Now, the government had all sorts of reasons as to why something was quarantined. But anyway, they were important, like bulbs. You saw J.P. Morgan's garden. I mean, one of that, that garden, um, I, I, I know a story of, a um, funny story about how those gardens were done. Those gardens would have two million bulbs. And they were all being hoarded and collected from Europe. And um, I have a wonderful story that uh, there is an estate that was in Pennsylvania, a very famous bulb garden. And they planted something like 1.8 million gardens, uh, bulbs. And um, in the first season, in the spring, they looked out over their garden, you know, this long rolling hills, and they saw these hordes of squirrels coming. <laughs> and, the, you know, you can imagine the squirrel, you know, all around, you know, saying, oh my God, lunch! You know, they got up in the spring and said, we're in good shape. And they raided this garden. And they had to replant two thirds of it all over again. So, they, 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 these, you know, you, you, when I talk about that kind of perfection in the background, is all sorts of. It's very complicated. But anyway, they did. That was a long answer, but no. What is the place of the garden clubs today? It the garden clubs. The garden club of America is well and alive. Um, they had by the 1930s 3,200. Uh, you know, they, they, the Garden Club of America has a central uh, office, and then there were all local garden clubs, and everybody reported back. Um, and the, what the Garden Club of America is very invested in now is, uh, is still in education and very involved in water, water, how are you going to have gardens without water, how you have gardens in a new, in a new, in a new environment and the new pressures of cities. 
They're very engaged with that. I mean, there's, it's interesting. I've spoken to many of the garden clubs across the, the country, and this is what people want to hear about. They want to hear about photography. They want to hear about water and the use of water in these gardens and the whole conservation effort. And you know, they didn't see it as environmental protection in the period. They saw it as conservation. And in this period is the beginning of the native plant movement, uh, the restoration of wildflowers. So they, they have a long 100 years of doing it. The Garden Club of America is 100 years yesterday, this year. Any other? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>